All right, well, welcome everybody um, to tonight's presentation up the old Bloomingdale Road with me. I know many of you know me because I recognize a lot of you, but just to give you a little bit of quick background about me, I have a bachelor's in architecture from Pratt Institute and a master's in museum leadership from Bank Street College. Uh, I've lived most of my life in Bloomingdale and with an educational background like that and just being who I am, I become very curious about my surroundings and I feel I fit in more when I know what it is I'm fitting into. So for a very long time, I've explored um, the neighborhood and I recall when I found out it was called Bloomingdale. Years ago, the name had really fallen out of disuse and was largely forgotten. Uh, but I remember uh, in the 80s or maybe right around 1990 in the uh, New York Times, if you're thinking of living in sec section in the uh, Sunday real estate, uh, if you're thinking of living in the Bloomingdale blocks and I was like, what, who, huh? Uh, I found it very surprising. And that was my first exposure to Bloomingdale. And as many of you know, the name is regaining prominence, basically through the efforts of people who live here, who want to define it as a district within the greater Upper West Side. Uh, so that's basically what I have to say about that if you don't recognize the name Bloomingdale. Um, but uh, let's, let's move on. Bloomingdale years ago was clearly a very different place. Uh, this is one of the many taverns that abounded in the district. And you could say largely the golden age of Bloomingdale, if there was one, started in the 17th, in the 18th century, sorry, and ran right through to about 1868. And why such a specific uh, a date? Well, it was in 1868 uh, that Boss Tweed and his thugs began ramming what was then called the Boulevard up roughly along the path of the old, uh, of the old Bloomingdale Road uh, and lining their pockets with all the money they made from uh, forcing people to sell property and, and uh, reboundering property and such. And in the process, they destroyed a great deal of what had been a very bucolic setting through the 18th and well into the 19th centuries. But at any rate, we're going to take a carriage ride today uh, up the old Bloomingdale Road just about this point in time. The third quarter of the 19th century, when Bloomingdale still looked a great deal like this, but where at the same time change was uh, cropping up everywhere. Uh, and I do need to um, sort of qualify what you're gonna be seeing today because we're going to visit a number of places, but in actual history, they did not all coexist at the same time. We're gonna see some places that cease to exist before we visit some other places that were created afterwards. So it's not going to be a specific day in a specific year, uh, let's say more along the fact it's gonna be a specific era. So uh, here we go. First of all, it's kind of obligatory for anybody talking about New York history to pull up the Ville map of 1865. This is a, a, a wonderful, marvelous map. And New York historians, uh, love to pull it up all the time just to show what the island was like before it was scraped flat and paved over. By 1865, a lot of the lower left side of this map was already altered, but Ville was able to surmise what had been there prior. And just to answer your question before you ask it, that brown area sort of as a halo around uh, lower Manhattan that indicates landfill. So the green is the original uh, shore of Manhattan as discovered by Henry Hudson. And I believe there were people here already. Uh, and the brown is uh, land which was used to expand out and create moorings and what have you. But if you look at this map, here is uh, 
Right. Uh, I'm going to try and see. I've never done this before, but I'm going to see if I can't. Uh, well, somewhere in here, there should be. Is this it? Yes. Can you? Uh, hopefully, you can all see that. It actually worked. I'm so proud of myself. Uh, there is a cursor. We are going to be looking at this area right along here. And in a moment, I'm going to blow it up for you. But this is the area uh, that was reachable by the old Bloomingdale Road. In Ville's map, you'll see he indicated a section called Bloomingdale Village. Now, technically, officially, on paper, there was no Bloomingdale Village. There was never an incorporated village of Bloomingdale. It was a large kind of meandering district which uh, encompassed a great deal of the Upper West Side, uh, starting roughly around 23rd Street, which is way down to the left, uh, and running all the way up to around uh, Manhattanville, which would be here in this cleft in the rock. Uh, it encompassed from about 23rd to 115th Streets, let's say. Uh, and that's uh, about 2,500 acres of land. So it was a sizable area. And when you said you were going up Bloomingdale, you would want to get a little more specific than that. You could refer to the milestones on the Bloomingdale Road at one point. But if you notice on the VLA map, there's a grid drawn across it. And that is the grid plan as we recognize it today. The commissioner's plan of 1811 divided Manhattan into a gridiron system, which, <clears throat> excuse me, pretty much um, we still have with some uh, aberrations to this day. Even though this uh, layout of streets did not appear up in the Bloomingdale district for many, many decades after 1811, people knew the streets were there and they had all been surveyed out. So at some point you could say, I'm going up the Bloomingdale Road uh, to 74th Street, let's say. And even though there was no 74th Street at the time, you had a, a general idea of where that was. Now, it's important that you understand how important the Bloomingdale Road. Here's a map from 1815, and you can see the grid plan is already there. This is gonna be one of the earliest maps showing the grid plan superimposed over pre-existing roads and uh, showing the property owners at the time. But that section in orange is the Bloomingdale Road. Uh, it was a lifeline for people who wanted to travel to the city from Blumendal. Now, where does this name come from? There's several different conflicting theories and people um, will really argue about this. But most people accept the fact that it was called Blumendal in Dutch times because it was such a pretty dale with flowers blooming in it, Blumendal. But other people argue that there is a Blumendal or Bloomingdale uh, located roughly between Harlem and Amsterdam in the Netherlands, in Holland. So here is this section between New Harlem and New Amsterdam so I suppose logically they should have called it New Blumendal, but they didn't. Anyway, when the British seized control of the island and the uh, province of uh, New Netherlands in 1664, gradually Blumendal became Bloomingdale, an anglicization of the Dutch. The Bloomingdale, Bloomingdale Road uh, was needed, as you see here, to augment transport of produce and tobacco. There were big tobacco farms up this way in the 18th century. And if the river was frozen, let's say, if it was a choppy stormy day or if boat transportation was simply not available. And if you look down at the lower left hand, you'll see a bay on this map. We're gonna talk about that in a little while. Uh, or if for some reason, farmers and residents up here needed to travel by land instead of by water to get down to the city, they needed a road in order to do that. And so the Bloomingdale Road was opened in 1703 on a pre-existing Native American trail. All folklore, which is true and which you've probably heard before. But what you've not heard before uh, is that the Bloomingdale Road and Broadway are not parallel. 
They overlap in certain areas, but if you look at this map, you'll see the four lines of transportation, the five lines of transportation, which were so essential to travel up uh, into this area of Manhattan uh, before the late 19th century. There on the far left is the West Side Railroad, which opened in 1849 and which is still there. Uh, then you see a largish, very regularly shaped, sort of light red colored roadway. That is Broadway, uh, which opened as the boulevard in 1868, as I mentioned. I, I brought up Boss Tweed and his thugs. And if you look su superimposed on it in a sort of an orangish color, is the pre existing Bloomingdale Road. So you can see there's spots right around 103rd and up through 108th, for instance, where they pretty much correspond. But down below 103rd Street, they're next to each other, but they don't line up. So it's not true that the Bloomingdale Road became Broadway. It sort of became Broadway. Then um, you notice uh, the line in blue, which is not uh, a line of transit, but it is a very important piece of modern technology that was introduced uh, into the neighborhood in the late 1830s, that's the Croton Aqueduct. And we're going to talk about that in a little while too. Notice the big curve it makes right at 107th Street before it straightens out again down at 104th and heads straight down into the city. You'll notice on this map, uh, Central Park already appears on the right side of the map, but we're talking about an era before Central Park was created, which would have been the late 1850s. And then finally, that yellow line, which is the line that changed everything. And that is the Ninth Avenue Elevated Railroad, which opened in 1879, uh, was the long awaited mass transit access to the city. And that's why the Upper West Side was developed so much later than the Upper East Side, because there was no really good, quick, reliable way to get up here. So it was largely an area of farms and small houses and country villas and mansions until quite late in the century. Okay, here we go. Uh, back in the day, if uh, we were lucky enough to own our own carriage, we could just say, oh, it's a beautiful day, let's go for a ride up to Bloomingdale. Or we might have rented a carriage. This is a Victoria. This is the kind of carriage that would have been used for our sort of trip in the middle to late 19th century. Where would we have gotten a Victoria or any kind of a carriage and horses? Uh, there would have been plenty of stables and, and uh, places to rent carriages littered all through the 40s and 50s on the West Side, which was still part of Bloomingdale, but was rapidly coming to be known as Hell's Kitchen. Uh, so we've rented a carriage, and we are going to head up to Bloomingdale. Right around what's now Columbus Circle, things began to change noticeably. The city, by the Civil War or so, had reached up into the 50s. But Columbus Circle was not called this yet, but a grand circle was planned for where Columbus Circle exists now, but it had not been laid out yet at this point in time. And what we're basically looking at is a bunch of small houses and the southern extension of a Somerendike farm. Uh, the Somerendikes were an old uh, uh, Bloomingdale family. They owned property as far back as the 1740s and uh, their farm stretched up about a half a mile from Columbus Circle. Uh, but you can see this farm, small houses, um, and we're actually going to visit some 18th century villages as well. Now, let's talk about Eliza Greatorex for a quick moment. She was a highly esteemed artist, a woman, unusual, and an Irish immigrant to boot. But she uh, became very enamored of Bloomingdale and liked to spend a lot of time up there. And as Boss Tweed uh, and his men were pushing their way through, demolishing points right and left, she made an effort to preserve uh, in drawing whatever it was that she could. Uh, so we have a series of drawings and a couple of paintings by her. Uh, and I'll explain what Harsonville was in a minute. 
all dating to just that period of time when everything was coming down. This is the DRIPS map of 1851. And as we drive up the Bloomingdale Road, we are going to notice that we're approaching what I guess at the time would have been considered thickly settled. That is this area right around here. This is Harsonville, named after the Harson family who owned property in this district from the 1760s and on. And as we're coming up, now note, remember it, this map shows all the avenues and streets, but they're not there yet. They're coming, but they're not there yet. All we really have at this point is the Bloomingdale Road, which my cursor is moving up right now. And then if you look up, uh, about here and there, these dotted lines are all little country lanes, which allowed you to get to different houses. And this one allows you to get down to the river uh, and what have you. But as we're approaching, Harsendal, the first thing we'll see is the Dutch, uh, the old Dutch church up on a promontory near 68th Street. Then we'll hit the center of town with Griffin's Hotel. Uh, and then here is the Harson Homestead, right at roughly 73rd Street now. And as we continue traveling up, we're going to see a number of sites. Here, the Orphan Asylum. Here, just north of it, the Sumrendike Estate. And we're going to travel up even further and we'll um, make a quick pick stop at Burnham's Hotel. So I just wanted you to sort of get oriented where we are. This is 79th Street. This is 72nd Street. And 11th Avenue, of course, is West End today. 10th Avenue is Amsterdam. And here on the map of 1851, there is no indication of Broadway because no one had even thought of it yet. So I mentioned the Bloomingdale Reformed Church. Here it is. It was founded in 1805. And this particular version of it was built in 1814. It stood at 68th Street until blue, the Boulevard Broadway smashed its way through the area, at which point it was demolished. Uh, it was rebuilt, but later moved all the way uptown to uh, between 106th and 107th Street. Uh, but it vanished as a congregation in the 1890s. Uh, so again, I just want to reinforce that this church was here until 1868. So if we were traveling up the Bloomingdale Road before that, we'd see it. However, if we were traveling up the boulevard after that point, we wouldn't see it anymore. So just bear in mind, I'm not being strictly chronological. There's the Harson Homestead, indeed one of the oldest families uh, in the region. The first part of this house was built in 1763 and it remained standing uh, until quite late in the 19th century into the 1890s. Uh, I have uh, conflicting dates for this photo. It was taken either in 1888 or in 1893, but, uh, it gives you an idea of what was still standing that late in the century. As we continue up the Bloomingdale Road, we enter the area around what is today Sherman Square. The Harsons had sold this area off in the early 1870s and the street grid was being laid out. And you can see how irregular the land is. Uh, that here that the lower section is the original uh, top of the island of Manhattan, which has yet to be filled in there. What we're looking at um, there in the distance in the center of the image is where Amsterdam Avenue and Broadway intersect today. So this is Verity Square today. But here it was still being referred to as, as Harsonville because old habits die hard. Uh, up at 73rd Street, if we looked over to our left, trying to glance at the river through the trees, we would see a very stately building rising on what is now Riverside Drive. Again, a street that was not conceived of in the early 19th century. This is the Orphan Asylum Society of New York. Uh, it was founded in 1806 to aid children adrift and alone after their widowed mothers had passed on and the society gave them jobs and tried to help them uh, 
learn the skills they needed to become self-supporting members of society. Uh, they moved uptown from Greenwich Village uh, as the city got more and more congested uh, into this structure, which was begun in 1836. But rapidly the building became antiquated. There was no running water at the time. There was no sewage system. And you know, it, it, it sort of became a D Dickensian uh, orphanage. In 1901, the building, which was hopelessly outdated and scandal ridden by that point, was purchased by Charles Schwab, who constructed the largest private house ever built on the island of Manhattan on this full block of land. But that takes us beyond the confines of our talk today. So let's continue driving up. We've admired this beautiful structure, but it's too soon to stop. We've only been traveling for about 45 or 50 minutes at this point. So shortly thereafter, we see this lovely country lane uh, branching off from the Bloomingdale Road, from the road at 75th Street. This is Summer and Dyke Lane. And this was the lane that connected the Bloomingdale Road with the Summer and Dyke Estate, which is here. Now, it looks a little ramshackle here because probably by 1868, it was becoming that. Uh, it, its days were numbered. Everybody knew that at this point. But uh, the homestead was built in 1745, even before the Harsons had moved here. Um, Elizabeth uh, Greatorex did an oil painting of this scene as well. And um, she wrote of this scene, these are her words, the remembrance of it will always be fresh in my mind, rising on this beautiful green knoll and no sign of the terrible uprooting which has been making such sad work with the freshness of Bloomingdale since the summer of 1868. Now, just north of here is a very different Bloomingdale, the home of Mayor Fernando Wood. Those of you who are city history buffs uh, know what a notorious character he was. Uh, he was a congressman and a mayor and just corrupt. I think they invented the word to describe him. He purchased a large portion of the Summering Dyke Farm in 1847, and he added this Swiss-style uh, country villa to the existing cottage, which was not the uh, Summering Dyke homestead that you saw in the previous drawing. This was a separate cottage on the farm as well, which dated to the 1750s or so. He kept the cottage standing and made it a wing of his large villa, uh, for, uh, as he said, um, for historical interest, because he just loved the idea of this little house plugged into his big mansion. And big is right. In 1857, he hosted a reception for presidential can uh, candidate James Buchanan in this building. Uh, Fernando Wood called the uh, estate Woodlawn, and he was a shrewdy, he was a shrewd real estate investor as well. And even though he knew this property ran uh, across 77th Street, he built the house across it anyway, uh, because he knew he'd be able to hold out for uh, a higher price for eminent domain if he didn't give in to the city right away. And so they paid him handsomely uh, for the right to put 77th Street through his property. And then uh, he actually built a stone wall around his entire estate and ignored the surveyors, ignored the process servers, ignored the city for another 40 years or so. Uh, when the um, street finally was cut through in 1899, the stone fence around it was said to have been swiped from the construction of Central Park. Uh, so he made money over and over and over again on this property. By the way, uh, this is where the Hotel Belclair stands today if you know that building. So we're gonna travel up just another block or two, and we're gonna see uh, Jan Cornelius Van den Heuvel's house. Uh, Van den Heuvel was the governor of Demerara, uh, which was one of the Dutch colonies in the Guianas. And he fled uh, because of a severe yellow fever outbreak in 1790. He settled in New York and he was charmed by the city and decided he wanted to remain there. So he quickly reestablished himself in business, made another fortune, 
and purchased 400 acres in Bloomingdale, uh, where he built this mansion. Uh, in 1839, William Burnham leased the mansion from his heirs, uh, and he opened it as a stylish roadhouse, which he called Burnham's after himself. And it became one of the places to stop for rest and, re and entertainment when making the trek up this way. And this was a very popular uh, way to travel at the time. In 1880, hard as, as it is for us to imagine today, it became a nursery. Uh, a garden nursery and the area of the house behind it stretching all the way uh, to West End Avenue was covered with greenhouses where they were uh, raising little seedlings. Uh, the mansion was demolished in 1901, but the owner at the time who was William Waldorf Astor stripped the uh, outstanding 18th century woodwork out of the mansion uh, and he installed it in his English manor house, uh, Cliveden. So the insides of this building may still be uh, seen in Buckinghamshire. Uh, the Apthorpe apartment building was built on the site in 1906. So moving right along, north of Harsonville, things get a little wilder, a little more bucolic. Uh, of course, this is a romanticized scene, but it gives you an idea of what the Bloomingdale road looked, uh, road looked like in mid-century. And if you look through that opening in the trees, you can see the Palisades in the distance. So um, it's, it's sort of mind boggling to think that 150 years ago, uh, which you know, in the course of human history is not that long ago a time, this is what this neighborhood looked like. Uh, now, as we're riding up the Bloomingdale Road, if we uh, are curious enough, we glance over to the east and we see the spire of an Episcopal church rising in the distance. And we may or may not know that prior to 1858, this little cluster of houses was Seneca Village. Now Seneca Village has come back into prominence nowadays after a hundred plus years of uh, anonymity, intentional anonymity. This was a community which was founded um, in uh, 1825 by free black Americans, African Americans. It was the first such community in New York City. At its peak, uh, which was right around the 1850s, there were 225 inhabitants living there, three churches, two schools and three cemeteries in a mixed community, which also included Irish and German immigrants. And most significantly, everybody got along. People who reminisced about Seneca Village years later talked about what a wonderful bucolic place it was. Uh, and you know, we can we can um, hypothesize forever if you want, but probably what was key was that this was a community of working people. So they everybody was in it together, and they watched out for themselves. Anyway, in the late 1850s, uh, the entire village was commandeered by the city and all the houses uh, were demolished, including the houses of uh, other people in the area. You can see there's some property here uh, and there's some property up here as well for the construction of, of Central Park. And uh, until very recently, there was a myth propagated that no one was displaced for the creation of Central Park. That is absolutely not true, but it's what the developers of Central Park wanted you to believe at the time. Anyway, let's get our placement here. This here is Central Park West today. Here's 86th Street. Uh, so everything from here and over is Central Park today. And this receiving reservoir is now the Great Lawn. So uh, that's today. Here's back in the day. And we could have seen this little community from Bloomingdale Road if we glanced through the trees and over the dales and hills. This is the Brennan farmhouse. Photograph was taken in 1879, but uh, the house goes back to some indeterminate past time. Looking at it, it appears to be 19th century, but very early. This is typical of many of the smallish farmhouses which dotted the landscape of Bloomingdale 
until the late 19th century. The road, that's the Bloomingdale Road right there on the left. And this house uh, sits pretty much uh, at the intersection of what became 84th Street after they succeeded in blasting through that huge outcropping of rock. Now, what makes this particular house special, and in fact, it was famous, is because in the summer of 1844, Edgar Allan Poe moved his wife, Virginia, uh, into rented rooms in this house to try to ease her suffering from tuberculosis. He thought that uh, moving from the sooty city, they were living in Greenwich Village at the time, up to the bucolic countryside would be good for her lungs and the quiet um, and, and beauty might help her gain some strength and recover. Well, as you probably all know, she did not recover. And uh, two years later in 1846, they moved again uh, to Fordham and Poe Cottage up in Fordham is still standing. Uh, this house was demolished in 1888, but what's particularly important about this house, why is it so famous? Edgar Allan Poe composed or wrote The Raven while he was living here. And that was a huge runaway, fabulous hit, made him a celebrity from, well, I can't say coast to coast because there was no West Coast at this point, but um, made him a, an international celebrity. And so people for years afterwards would travel up this way and point the house out as where the Poes lived for a short while. Uh, down this road in what is now Riverside Park, there's a large rock outcropping called Mount Tom. And uh, Poe used to love to uh, hang out there as well and contemplate the vista of the river and the boats going by. Okay, famous for a whole nother reason. This is Elmwood which we would be seeing in the distance, the old Apthorpe Mansion uh, near 90th Street and 10th Avenue. This photo was taken in 1891, just before it was demolished. It was built by Charles Ward Apthorpe Jr. in 1764 on an estate of almost 300 acres and was renowned as the most elegant of all the fine mansions in Bloomingdale. It served as headquarters for both sides during the Revolutionary War and George Washington definitely slept here. Uh, the house boasts a very colorful and important history which is well worth exploring. Uh, and I uh, recommend that you just spend some time on Google and look up Elmwood, Apthorpe Estate, all sorts of stuff will pop up about it. It has a very important history in the American Labor Union, uh, history uh, related to Irish immigration. Uh, the house became a country hotel, resort, and public picnic grounds. Uh, and it was extremely popular. When it was uh, demolished, there was enormous protest about tearing this property down. One could say it was almost perhaps the very first historic preservation movement in the country. Another house that you've probably seen, you've seen this photograph anyway, because it pops up a lot if you look for old photographs or photographs of old New York. This is Dr. Valentine Mott's villa. Uh, this is photographed in 1855 by French photographer, Victor Provost, who was here in America for just a few years. And the house, had, the villa had just been completed at that point. Uh, Dr. Mott was uh, an extremely, uh, beloved figure in, um, in New York history. Uh, he uh, helped to um, encourage um, anesthesia during the Civil War. And he was truly one of the most beloved uh, residents of New York City at this point. And here is, uh, this wonderful photograph can be very misleading because here's another taken on the same day, which gives you a better sense of how the house was situated, here it is right in the middle of the photograph. And you can see that it's in a cluster of little houses and it's very villagey. And that other photo looks like it's rising up all by itself in stately grandeur. But uh, this is basically 94th Street and um, Broadway. The house was moved when the boulevard was plowed through 13 years later, and it actually remained standing into the early 20th century on the corner of 93rd and Broadway. Well, we're approaching Strikers Bay, 
And I mentioned uh, before that we were going to talk about this little uh, indentation here. This is Strikers Bay. You know, there's Strikers Bay houses in the area and there's a couple of other things with the name Strikers Bay. Uh, there was a tavern, here it is, right here. I don't know if it looked exactly like that, but um, that indicates that there's a building there. And it was a very, very popular location. But um, the Strikers owned the property for um, quite a long time. Uh, the original owner was one of the first property owners in Bloomingdale. And uh, he settled the whole area back in the late uh, 17th century. But uh, there's another interesting um, anecdote about this particular area, which nowadays is in Riverside Park. Uh, uh, and that's in 1837, a poet uh, by the name of George P. Morris stopped, and here's the, the illustration shows you, walked up to this man who was chopping down a tree. Now, there were probably a lot of trees, uh, even in 1837, but this one apparently was quite beautiful. And George Morris was so upset at the sight of this man taking an ax to this magnificent stately uh, tree, which was probably an elm that grew all over the area in those days. He begged him to stop and the man needed the wood and finally he paid him $50 in 1837 to spare the tree. So he basically bought the tree and the tree remained protected as long as it uh, continued to live. The poem was so popular that uh, shortly afterwards, Henry Russell uh, composed a tune to the poem, Woodman Spare That Tree. And this is how it goes. Woodman spare that tree, but not a I'll tell you, that's a toast sound for all right. Uh, well, moving right along, uh, this is what um, Stryker's Mansion looked like, Rosevale, near 97th Street, Columbus Avenue. Uh, and here we are approaching um, the, what we might think of as the village of Bloomingdale. Key to this uh, illustration is this building right here. This is St. Michael's Church. And it's the original St. Michael's Church, not the one certainly we know of today. And if you look, you can see it's straddling what became 11th Avenue and its entrance faced the Bloomingdale Road. But uh, here's the original St. Michael's. Uh, built in 1806, what's very interesting about this church is that uh, the area was filled with very wealthy people, particularly in the summer. And if they wanted to go for services, wealthy people in those days uh, equaled Episcopalians. They either had to go down to St. Mark's in the Bowery or all the way up to Yonkers to St. John's in Getty Square. So a bunch of them got together and subscribed to create a small church in 1806. Uh, and among those subscribers was Mrs. Alexander Hamilton, who lived two miles north in the Grange. This church outgrew its usefulness in 1854. And so a wooden church was built, this time facing Amsterdam Avenue. But the rear of the church still abutted up against the Bloomingdale Road. That is the Bloomingdale Road uh, there in the lower corner of this photo. But that church only lasted until the new St. Michael's was constructed in the early 20th century, in 1891, I'm sorry. Uh, and that, of course, sorry about this photo, I don't know what happened here. That, of course, is still standing to this day. If we look past St. Michael's, we would see the Croton Aqueduct stretching across a field called Clendenning Valley, named after the farmer who owned uh, his last name was Clendenning. Uh, and there was an actual Roman aqueduct stretching from 107th Street down to about 95th, 96th Streets. Now moving right along up the Bloomingdale Road around 99th and 100th Street, 
there is this intriguing photo which was uh, identified about 15 years ago as a photo of the Furness estate, uh, in which case it would make this arguably the oldest photograph of New York City ever taken. Uh, the photographer is standing on the Bloomingdale Road. There's a pathway here that leads to a gate, uh, to a rise in land and a corral and another corral. And this is the Furness Mansion, built around 1800, uh, it also has a very uh, colorful history. Uh, it was owned by a family who stubbornly resisted developers into the 20th century. Eventually, they leased the property to Alma Walker, who made it an artist colony. Uh, in the New York Sun in 1903, the following appeared. Mrs. Walker wants it understood that she doesn't run a boarding house. She rents rooms to artists and serves meals to them. So in a sense, this was uh, an early artist colony. And among those served were the writers, Paul Wilstock, Paul, um, Paul Kester, and his brother, Vaughn Kester, and Gertrude Stein. Uh, in 1909, it was finally demolished and the neighborhood mourned its loss. Uh, if you wanna know more about this property, I also recommend uh, reading up on it. One of my favorite sources for this sort of thing is Daytonian in Manhattan. If you don't know that blog, it's excellent. Daytonian in Manhattan. Um, right next door was the Abbey Hotel. This was also a country mansion built by, the, by Humphrey Jones originally in the mid 18th century. And it changed hands a number of times. Uh, Cherry Lane, uh, Tree Lane Street, led from roughly 100th Street and the road to the mansion house, which consisted of 30 rooms and a separate house known as the cottage. This estate was subdivided in 1835. The mansion stood between what's now 101st and 102nd streets, just west of today's West End Avenue. I could see where it stood right out the window of my kitchen, if it was still there. Killian Van Rensselaer converted it into the Abbey Hotel in the 1840s. It was enormously popular. Uh, and it was a profitable venture which hosted fox hunts, balls, excursions, and boxing matches. Uh, it was an absolute destination, and this might be a great place for us to stop for lunch if we wanted to, except it was destroyed by lightning in 1859. So it depends what year we're here. Here is the Downs Boulevard Hotel and Restaurant. That road in the foreground is 103rd Street, and the Boulevard Broadway is just to the right outside of this picture. It was taken on July 1st of 1888. And this is typical of the roadhouses which appeared along Bloomingdale Road and the Boulevard around the middle of the 19th century. This uh, would have been, I'm sure, a very nice place to stop, but it, um, it wouldn't be the Abbey Hotel. And then um, just above this is uh, the Woodlawn Hotel. This was a second Woodlawn, I guess the name wasn't copyrighted, and this was the Nicholas Jones estate of 109 acres. That's 106th Street on the left. This photo was taken in 1890, just shortly before it was uh, demolished. And you can see a very recognizable Broadway there in the foreground in this photograph. Uh, during the Battle of Harlem Heights, um, the fighting took place all around this house. And when um, Mrs. Trollope, uh, wrote Domestic Manners of the Americans in 1832, which was a very critical book about how uncouth she thought Americans were. Uh, she did write that Woodlawn was the loveliest mansion in the beautiful village of Bloomingdale. Now we're gonna pass 110th Street now. And at this point, we would see the Leek and Watts Orphan Asylum. This incredibly important building architecturally was designed by Ithiel Town. Uh, and it rose majestically like some magnificent uh, municipal building high atop the farms spreading out all around it, completed in 1843. In 1847, President Polk visited the building when he took his own tour of Bloomingdale. Um, it's still standing, or parts of it are anyway, and this is the Greek temple, which is blocking the construction of the world's largest Gothic cathedral. And amazingly enough, uh, it is not landmarked. 
Just north of this was the Bloomingdale Lunatic Asylum, completed in 1821. It originally housed 200 inmates on 80 acres of park-like grounds. And as the century progressed, this building was rife with corruption and scandals and people being incarcerated who were not insane because their families tried to put them away and get their money and what have you. Uh, again, another terribly antiquated building. It had no uh, connection to sewers and the raw sewage from the building ran through a conduit and was dumped right onto the street itself. Uh, as the area became more and more urbanized, the land simply became too valuable and they wanted to locate the asylum further away from civilization. So they sold the property to Columbia University and moved the asylum up to White Plains where it still exists today. But the oldest building on Columbia, Columbia University is part of the asylum and that's Buell Hall, which was built in 1885 as a residence for wealthy patients of Lunatic Asylum that's standing in Columbia University right now today. So this is right about where the Bloomingdale Road originally ended. Uh, it was extended a couple of times, but um, uh, we could have gone up to Claremont, which was the old Pollock estate. And uh, that was located uh, in the knoll called Strawberry Hill, right behind where Grant's tomb is standing today. Uh, unfortunately, um, well, let's talk about the Pollocks for a second. He uh, built the property in 1795, and unfortunately, two years later, his uh, little son, St. Clair Pollock, fell off that cliff in the distance and died in the fall. And you, I'm sure many of you know the monument to the amiable child, which stands there now. That is St. Clair Pollock's actual burial site. Um, uh, the fire, which um, uh, occurred on March 14th, 1951, uh, many people at the time said that your pal and mine, Robert Moses, said it because he was trying to get rid of the building. We've reached the end of the Bloomingdale Road and it takes us to the little um, community, the little village, the little, little hamlet of Manhattanville, which was founded in 1806 and was an actual independent village, independent of New York City and located around the area that's now Broadway and 125th Street. Uh, one of the reasons why Broadway, uh, 125th Street to this day, as you know, veers markedly northwards uh, right here in this area, which is why 125th Street and 130th Street can intersect and what have you. Uh, this is what Manhattanville looked like in the day, an independent little community. And you, we could continue on from here if we wanted to and make what was called the 14 mile circle, or we could turn around and head back down on Bloomingdale Road uh, and have dinner at one of those fabulous places we drove by. But uh, somebody we all know who did like to make the 14 mile circle and did it several times while he was living in New York was uh, your pal and mine. Well, that takes us to the end of the Bloomingdale Road. And I wanna thank you for your attention. Um, and I'm gonna stop sharing now. And we're pretty much wrapping up. That lasted longer than I expected it to naturally. But uh, I wanna thank you all for attending. And I'm gonna just real quickly look at the questions. Uh, why and when was the name Bloomingdale no longer used? Okay, uh, that's, that's a great question, which I'll answer really quickly. Bloomingdale fell out of fashion because of the notoriety of the Bloomingdale Lunatic Asylum. Uh, in the 1880s, when the neighborhood was being uh, urbanized as an extremely high-end chic district, um, Bloomingdale just had too many negative connotations, according to the developers. And so they wanted to call it something a little tonier and a little more English sounding. So it became the West End. They were also the people who christened uh, Broadway, the Boulevard, who who. Um, and so West End became Upper West Side and gradually the, the area above 96th Street was absorbed into the Upper West Side. But now there's a strong movement underway to rechristen uh, the blocks north of 96th and south of 110th Street as Bloomingdale once again. And if you 
uh, go online and just type in Bloomingdale Upper West Side, you'll see a number of maps, uh, very official maps like Wikimedia and Wikipedia coming up with Bloomingdale indicated as the district for up here. Uh, I'm gonna wrap things up now. I wanna thank you all so much. I hope you enjoyed our trip. Stay if you want and enjoy uh, the area. Uh, maybe have dinner at Burnham's or I'm gonna head back down into the city myself. Mm -hmm. So be well all and I'll see you on the Bloomingdale Road.